Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, Alleluia. Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Acts. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found him at Azotus, and he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Psalm 22, verses 24 through 30. Please read in unison. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. 
for kinship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him, my descendants shall serve him, and they shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from First John. <clears throat> Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loves us so much, we all also love another, one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed that love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness at the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we within this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment that we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and the Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In his novel, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis describes the narrator's first moments in what we might call the, the outer courts of heaven. Upon arriving on a bus, yes, a bus, from purgatory or hell, depending upon one's perspective, the main characters um, find heaven to be painful not because of some punishment that awaits them there, but because this main character has never encountered somewhere so real. The grass is so profoundly vivid and true that his uninitiated body cannot bear it. Lewis writes, 
It was the light, the grass, the trees that were different, made of some different substance, so much solider than things in our country that men were ghosts by comparison. Walking proved difficult. The grass, hard as diamonds to unsubstantiated feet, made me feel as if I were walking on wrinkled rock, and I suffered pains like those of the mermaid in Hans Andersen. He is referring, of course, to the mermaid in Hans Christian Andersen, who, after having given up her tail and her life in the sea, feels each step on dry ground like knives in her feet. As the great divorce proceeds, we learn that the fellow travelers on the bus all perceive heaven in this same way. Heavenly beings come from across the mountains to greet these bus riders and try to help them into the absolute reality of God's presence back over across the mountains. And in order to be able to go with these beings over across the mountains, each person must give up something that he or she holds on to, even after death. Whether bitterness, vice, or pride, each person learns that the only way to stay, to go across those mountains, is to give up what holds them back. And it's not as easy as it may sound. Giving up on those obstacles means giving themselves away. It means letting go of attributes that they perceive to most truly describe who they thought they were. Some of them are unable to do so. And so they board the bus and they return to that intermediate place, comfortable in the shadow world that it is. Yet time after time, they have the opportunity to take that trip to heaven again, perhaps staying you know, a little longer with each visit, releasing their souls to grow a bit more into that reality that goes beyond all reality. The visitors come across the mountains to, to meet them every time they come up there, drawing out of them what needs to be abandoned, chipping away until there is only left the naked, loved soul, laden with the fruit of forgiveness, who is then able to enter into God's presence for all eternity. The process of pruning the soul is unpleasant. Yet the process of pruning the soul is unavoidable. Even the most fruitful of souls remain in the need of cutting back. Without regular thinning, even the most luscious of branches, the most holy of God's people, begins to plateau in its fruit production. Jesus tells his disciples that he is the vine through whom all life flows. Those who believe in him are the branches receiving the life that flows from that vine. 
God the Father is the vine grower who tends the branches, thinning out where the foliage has grown too thick and the fruit production has slowed, pruning out the dead, unproductive wood, cutting back the spindly branches to force them to thicken up and to bear the load of even more fruit. If you know anything about pruning fruit trees, you have to get rid of some of the blossoms in order for fruit to produce. The, the old rule of thumb is that it's about a fist apart on a branch. You pop off blossoms that are closer than a fist apart so that the fruit that does grow has the nutrients and the space to be the best that it possibly could be. This pruning process <laughs> maybe for the trees and then for us, can be terrifying. Like the characters in The Great Divorce who refuse to part with those pieces of themselves that impede their entrance into heaven, we too may fear letting go of parts of ourselves, especially the aspects that are already bearing good fruit, that are in blossom. The coming of the vine dresser, then, meant to be joyful and life giving, may elicit from us fear and anxiety and maybe even anger. But Martin Luther wrote But God is not a tyrant, He is a pious vine dresser who tends and works his vineyard with all faithfulness and diligence and surely does not intend to ruin it. He does not let his vineyard stand there to be torn to pieces by dogs and wild sows. He tends it and watches over it. He is concerned that it bear well and produce good wine. Therefore, he must hoe and prune so as not to chop and cut too deeply into the stem and the roots, take off too many branches or trim off all of the foliage. Let us be unafraid, Luther writes. Let us not be terrified by the prongs and teeth of the devil and the world, for, for God will not let them go beyond what serves our best interests. Like Luther, I do not believe that God sends troubles into our lives to prune us. But I do believe that God can take the troubles of this world, the prongs and teeth of the devil and the world, as Luther says, and use them for our good if we allow it. As a seminarian, which was a long time ago now, I had to take courses on church music. And in my first year, in my first class, I sat there bored out of my brain as the professor instructed us on the difference between whole notes and quarter notes. This was insulting to me. <laughs> I had a degree in music, you see. I had grown up in a boys choir singing the great repertoire of the church. I tried my hardest to get out of these classes. And they did let me do some independent study on some subjects that interested me, but they didn't let me off the hook completely. I had to sit through several entry-level courses, and I resented it. I would sit through those classes embittered against the teacher and against the institution that had forced her upon me. Now, God did not send those courses into my life. They were a part of the normal curriculum for every student. But God took those courses and used them to pry away from me some of the self-inflated view I had of myself. To my great astonishment, 
I didn't know everything there was to know about church music. I was humbled. And out of this humbling, I grew in appreciation for styles of music that never before would I have taken seriously. I learned to point text, which means that I could sing the liturgy even up to this very day. I was cut back in order that I might bear more fruit. Life is full of growth, pruning, and growth again. As one commentator put it, our goal is not merely to hang on to the vine, but to bear fruit, to be more and more productive of fruit drawing our life and sustenance from the vine to which we remain attached. And so when you leave here and you go out into this day, which I hope is beautiful, you know, we're recording this on a Wednesday, and it's gorgeous today, and I hope your Sunday is as well. But when you leave your homes today and you go out and you mow your grass or you work in your garden, Remember that your own pruning could be just around the corner. And so let go of that which slows your spiritual growth. And with those characters in the great divorce, take one more timid step out into the verdant reality of God. And maybe this time the grass won't hurt your feet as much as it did the last. Now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, saying, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray especially for Kim Lee Dunn, postulate for the priesthood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us the reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and give them courage and hopes in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for those on our parish prayer list, including Bruce, Amanda, Tim, Kathleen, Derek, Witt, Dale, Caroline, Eddie, Emily, the Browns, Barbara, Megan, Margaret, Frank, George and Barbara, Libby, Martha, Rita, Ed, Sue, Darcy, Courtney, David, Helen, George, Barbara, Muriel, D, the James family, Joe, Emily, Michael, Elliot, Madison, Tara, and Kathleen, Gary, Peter and the family, Ruby, Larry, Jim, Bethany, Art, Elaine, Lloyd, Paula, Libby, Ann, Janet, Martha, Renee, May, Jim, Rick, Jay, Ruth, Tracy, William, Sean, Tommy, Anna, Samuel, John, Elizabeth, Pat, Tom, and those who we name at this time aloud are in our hearts. That they may know the healing power of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Friends, it is the fifth Sunday in Easter, and I am glad we are gathered together wherever we may be on this day. Whether you're watching it on Sunday, whether you're watching it some other day, I'm glad that you are praying with us. A reminder that you can make your offering by scanning with your smartphone the QR code on the screen or in the bulletin that you may have printed out. You can also, you know, of course, mail it in or use the website. Just a reminder that those things, those needs still continue in the life of the church. And that Wednesday nights we still have supper that you can pick up and take home with you and eat, um, and eat later on, but it's pre-packaged and pre-prepared, a way to, to ease your schedule and also to remind you that Wednesday night suppers will return one day. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, According to his command, O oh Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O oh Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to the heavenly country, where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. And the blessing of God, Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. 
Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>